everyone, it's Jarvi from Wild Engineering. Uh, today we're going to be starting a tutorial series using Digital the Logic Simulator. It's free and it's online and it runs in a jar. So let's get started. Okay, so to do that, first we need to open up our web browser. We're going to use Firefox. Uh, I'm going to type in Digital the Logic Simulator. And a lot come up. We're looking for the one that says H-N-E-E-M-A-N-N. -E -E this is the one we want. Alright, so we look through this. So first, let's read through the README, because nobody ever does, and you should really read over the README. This thing is, this simulator is fantastic. Um, so basically, well, it's exactly what it says. It's an easy-to-use digital logic designer and circuit simulator designed for educational purposes, and it's so much faster than Logism and it supports modern things that Logism didn't. So, and this has developer support, so like that's why we're doing this tutorial series in this. Uh, it's able to do a lot of things. Here's some screenshots. It's able to do k-mapping. Uh, you can map uh, just uh, truth tables to some sort of expression. And I hate doing design like that, but if you prefer doing design like that, well, feel free. You'll get some generic design that you can plug into a PLA. Alright, so we're going to click this download and installation button. Literally just click it, yada yada yada, download your file, and then when you open it, uh, it'll be in a folder, and you're just going to launch the jar. So you could basically just take that jar file and put it on a USB, and any computer you go, you plug that USB in, you, d you launch the jar, and you can run this program. You can do it at school, on any computer. And the, the files are lightweight, so literally like a 4 gig flash drive is more than enough. Alright, continuing on. So there's some features. So visualization of signal states, states just like Lonesome. Sig, uh, sig, single gate mode to analyze oscillations that Lonesome did not have. Lonesome liked to oscillate randomly when they shouldn't, and the circuit would be fine in, under, like in a good simulator. So this actually knows how to handle like a lot of complexity, and it won't oscillate randomly. Uh, analysis and synthesis of combinational a combinatorial and sequential circuits, yeah. Simple testing. Uh, they got so many examples that are built in. They even uh, I was talking with the developer, and now they've added added a Mandelbrot example. Uh, it contains a library with most commonly used 7400xx, well 7400 series logic. Uh, supports generic circuits, yada yada. So you can like uh, you can uh, create a barrel shifter with selectable bit width or something like that. Uh, although. What sucks about uh, the built-in barrel shifter is it's not exportable to VHDL, so you'd have to build your own. But we'll get there. Anyway, so good performance. Yes, this example of uh, processor can be clocked at 120 kilohertz. Uh, you couldn't get probably more than 500 uh, hertz out of Logism on a CPU that was like a complex design. So like, think about those orders of magnitude. Uh, you can click on Logism and tell it to run it at like 400 kilohertz or, or four, 4 kilohertz or whatever like that, and it won't do it. it, it you just have the option to do it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's possible to write custom components for in Java. Uh, components can be described using VHDL or Verilog. Open source VHDL simulator. GHDL needs to be installed to simulate a VHDL defined components. But you can use, uh, you can export your VHDL and then run it on, well, an FPGA or a CPLD if you have one. So it's exactly what it says here. Circuit can be exported to VHDL or Verilog. There's direct support for the Basis 3 board, which I have. So we are going to be doing examples with the Basis 3 board. Um, and with another FPGA board as well. Um, and it also supports uh, JETIC files, which are for like really old chips. Like you said, introduced in 1985. Um, and then there are also the ATF-150X chips. Now these are modern chips that I use at work. They're CPLDs. Uh, here, uh, products. Uh, uh, we'll just search, search, search. Embedded, super bright. Man, what the heck. Search, CPLD. Here we go, yeah. Uh, so here's their, their 1500 series logic, uh, 1502, 1504, 1508, 1508 is bigger, bigger uh, chips you can get that are CPLDs. Uh, for instance, you got 128 registers, 128 microcells. You can clock at like the 83 megahertz or something like that. 
it's very low power. So, and you got a good amount of pinout on it. So anyway, yeah, let's not get too distracted, but this supports update, uh, like exporting files straight to those. So that's really nice. SVG support, so you can like make custom diagrams for all your stuff. Uh, and it's basically been tested balls the wall. Uh, and you can read even more about how the oscillations it works, like with launches and it's hard to find the root cause, but this, it, there's no oscillations. You won't get random oscillations. Um, yeah, and so now that we have the file, we can use it. Okay, so now that we've downloaded digital, let's explore how the menu works. So we have a new file button, a open button. You can zoom in, zoom out, and fit the whole thing to your window. So if you have a lot of stuff, logic on the screen, uh, you can fit it to a window so you see everything at once. You have a play button. Uh, single single step mode and run all test cases in the circuit. So this is different from digital in the fact that you have to start the simulation. There's two modes to digital, building and simulating. Uh, unlike Logism where the simulation was done as you built, which is why the uh, thing got oscillation issues. There was no way to prevent it. So this this is why this has better performance. It splits up the build phase from this, the simulation phase. So let's do that. Let's uh, actually show you how to do something in here. So we have files where we can open and save. We can edit circuit specific settings and I will show you how all this is done later when we get to that. You have a lot of functionality in here. There's so much that this can do. You have your general settings here. So if you want to get into dark mode like I have, you just check your color scheme dark. Otherwise you can go back to normal mode and you get ugh, that. You get blinded. So there's how you get dark. Let's go back. We, I'm going to use English. I like this is my notation. This is my favorite notation. I like stars as and. I like exclamation mark as not. And I like plus as or because you can write it on any keyboard. There's no specialty needed. So uh, that is my favorite. But you can switch between your favorite. So now we can go and show our grid or not show our grid, so I'm pretty sure you can understand what that does. Yeah. Uh, show our grid. Show the number of wires on a bus. That's pretty nice. We'll enable that. No tooltips for components on the main panel. Uh, we'll leave that. Wire tooltips. If set, lines are highlighted when the mouse hovers over them. Sure. What about... Wait, what is it? If set, lines are highlighted. Okay, yeah. And if, if set, no tooltips for the components on the main menu are displayed. Oh yeah, I don't need tooltips for components on the main menu, but we'll leave those on for people to do. Um, and component tree view is visible at startup. Uh, nah, we'll, we'll leave it like that. And then you go to your, uh, I like to use the IEEE shapes. So here's what, the, uh, if you go to your components, logic, grab an end gate, here's the IEEE shape. Now watch what happens if we go to uh, the settings and we change that and we don't use the IEEE shapes. Oh, we have to restart. That's fine. Anyway, here is a uh, here is that with the IEEE notation, which is trash. So now, if we go back to our settings and put our IEEE shapes, we have to restart, relaunch. Gotta fit it back to my window here, and there you go. So that's the difference between the IEEE shape and the non IEEE shape. And then you can change your libraries and all that stuff. So if you want to use like the ATF 15XX chips, you need to download a fitter. So I'm using the wind couple fitter uh, for AT MIPS. I, MIPS, I have that. There's my Verilog and GHDL, um, and that's my tool chain config. So now you can see the settings that I have set. So if you have any questions, you can look here. Okay, so now we're good. I'm gonna delete that. So now we have our simulation, our analysis, so we can uh, synthesize an expression out of an, a, a truth table. Uh, and then you have your components. 
So in your logic, you have and, nand, or, nor, xor, xnor, a not gate, and then a lookup table. The reason that you have these is because that's the logic that FPGAs have. IO, you have the output pin, an LED, just in simulation. Uh, input pin, so output and input is useful for like FPGA stuff. Clock input, also useful for FPGA stuff. Button is just for simulation, really. Dip switch, just really for simulation. Uh, text and probe is just for simulation, obviously. Data graph for simulation. They have displays that's for simulation. All of this stuff is just really simulated here, but uh, well, you could use the pinout, I guess. Uh, you would have, you could map those pins to your FPGA's pins, but you'd have to do it manually. So you just have to label them F, uh, seven segment one, and then if it's A or B, what yada yada. yada. But you, those would work. Uh, mechanical, uh, you could actually map those. Uh, and keep preferable, you can actually map those as well. So then you have wires, ground, supply, voltage, constant. So we'll be using all this. Plexer, so you can mux, demux, decode. You can select a bit. So if you had, uh, you have a string of bits and you want the fifth bit, this will just tell you what if the fifth bit is one or zero. You have to be, you know, priority encoders. I've never really understood what those do. I don't get them. I never used one. And an SR latch. An SR latch that's clocked, a JK latch, or flip flop, but I'm sorry. Um, D flip flop, T flip flop, JK flip flop, asynchronous, so there's no. Uh, on the set and reset, it, there's no clock. You can do that independently. But if you want to do both at the same time, you can clock it, I guess. D flip flop, asynchronous. Uh, oh, yeah, so there's a set and clear, so that's why it's asynchronous. And then a mono flop. So you can just like create a pulse that's for like really simulation only. You can't export that as VHDO. Memory, you got RAM for, with separated ports, block RAM, so you can export to FPGA stuff. Uh, RAM, bi directional port, RAM chip, chip select, register file, RAM with a dual port, and graphics RAM. So that's really nice having dual port RAM and also having graphics RAM because this actually will produce a window in your simulation that will display an end by end area that you have chosen. So if you chose 128 by 128, you get 128 pixels by 128, and then you get to address it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we have adder, subtract, multiply, divide. Divide won't have a VHDL output. Barrel shifter won't have a VHDL output. Comparator will, the negation will, the sign extender will, and the bit counter will. Switches, just more, more for simulation. You get your transmission gates there if you like using those. Miscellaneous stuff. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at how the menu works, I'm going to stop the tutorial there and we'll pick it up with in the next one when we go over how to actually use the menus. But I'm sure you can, now that you know how they work, you'll experiment with them before the next tutorial. And then we're going to get used to actually building some logic and then we're going to start building uh, complexity. And eventually I'm going to be working up to building a MIPS CPU. And I, I don't know if I should do this, but I don't know what quite I should do if I should try to implement my IntelliRed architecture in this simulator and then still write my own assembler for the fun of it and also use that for like, you know, how do you write your own assembler? Well, here's a tutorial on how to do that as well. Um, or if I should just try to implement MIPS and then I could just use the native MIPS assembler without ever having to touch mine. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, MIPS would require a uh, full byte addressable RAM and it's 32 bits where my IntelliRed is word addressed and 16 bits which is just an easier architecture to implement. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll just do IntelliRed. Fuck it. Yeah, so that's it for this one. If you guys like, don't forget to subscribe, uh, like the video, ring the bell, uh, click the all, uh, ring the bell and then click the all thing and in every video I upload you'll know. And uh, yeah, on the next one, we'll actually get started on some advanced logic. Well, until then, peace out.